Dear friends, it's with a heavy heart that I speak to you today. Uh, every Sunday, I travel to Temple Beth Torah in Humble, Texas to give a Parsha class. But as you well know, uh, Houston, the Houston area, was hit very heavily over the weekend and last night by Hurricane Harvey. And there was just an insane amount of raining and flooding. And the hurricane had multiple spiraling bands of rain uh, creating historic flooding. And the way they measure flooding is by levels, how often they're supposed to happen. So this was a 500-year flood level, and it's just catastrophic disaster. We have the bayous are overflowing, the highways are flooded, uh, even some roads, they caved in under sink holes. Uh, roadways are littered with abandoned cars. The airports are closed and flooded. Uh, on, the, on the highways, people are driving in the opposite direction on freeways to get to safety. Uh, television studios are flooded. They're abandoned. Uh, houses and property devastated. Um, many of our Houston friends uh, have their houses flooded. And some of them are, are flooded so badly that the public officials uh, are advising people, if your home is flooded, don't go to the attic. Go to the roof. Take white towels with you so that the first responders uh, in the U.S. Coast Guard can find you. In some places, the water has reached uh, even 20 feet. And I saw someone write online that it's the equivalent, the amount of precipitation is equivalent as if there was 40 feet of snow that had fallen. And to put this in perspective, annually, Houston averages about 50 inches of rain. So far, in some places, we've already gotten in a day between 25 and 30 inches of rain, and an additional one to three feet of rain are forecast by the next couple of days. Uh, I read online that the officials are recruiting anyone who has a boat or any high water vehicle to come help with the rescue efforts. And over the course of the afternoon, right now, it's actually kind of calm and it's nice and it's weirdly, bizarrely, ironically sunny outside, uh, but... It slowed down, and we're expecting to see more flooding, more rain over the next couple of days. I even saw uh, some models have uh, su suggestions that Harvey, the hurricane, is going to go back into the Gulf of Mexico, scoop up more water, and smash Houston again. I saw online, and this is really devastating, that it's impossible to know now, but according to some experts, the devastation is going to actually surpass Hurricane Katrina as the costliest natural disaster in U.S. history. And it really breaks the heart to think about all the friends and all the people we know and all the neighbors that we don't know who have their homes and their cars and their property uh, just absolutely devastated. You know, for us, thankfully, our neighborhood is relatively okay. The house is not flooded. Uh, the streets uh, are somewhat flooded, but it hasn't reached the house yet. Some houses have lost power, thankfully, uh, ours did not. Uh, I did hear a report of a gator uh, prowling around the neighborhood. Uh, that is uh, unverified. I, I did see some pictures. I'm, it's not so clear to me. But either way, it's very dangerous. And please, everyone, if you're hearing this, and you, uh, stay safe uh, and follow orders from the officials. Now, Meyerland, the neighborhood where the Torch Center is located, is actually completely flooded. And you see pictures online, it's it's devastating. You know, the Torch Center, where we work, uh, is actually under several feet of water. And I want to give a public thank you to Alex Gonick, who kayaked uh, from all the way down Brazewood uh, to go to the Torch Center and to rescue the Torah books. We have a library full of Torah books, and as the water's levels are rising, uh, it's progressively uh, it damaging uh, various books. So he came with his crew and they rescued the Torah books and he actually went next door to Rabbi Jacobian's shul uh, and took the Torah scrolls. And as you think about how dev devastated, no one was prepared for this and took the Torah scrolls to safety. So thank you so much, Alex. I want to share a positive message. You know, this is Houston. We've been hit really hard. Uh, thankfully for our family, it's not as bad, but I feel like, you know, the people in Houston are my family and many of our friends and many of our board members and especially people living in Meyerland and U.S. neighborhood, they really, uh, really suffered. Uh, but I think we have to realize that we're resilient. We're resilient people. We are a resilient city. We will rebuild. 
And uh, for us at Torch, we, ha- you know, our Torch Center that we built a couple of uh, uh, years ago, or a year and a half and change ago, it's now flooded. And the uh, it's going to take a Herculean effort to rebuild it. Uh, if you want to help donate towards the rebuilding of Torch, please go to torchweb.org. I'm going to put the link in the description of the podcast. Torah will not stop. Harvey has devastated us, but we're going to continue and forge ahead. This week is Parsha's Kiseitze. Kiseitze means when you shall go out. And this Parsha is unique because it has more mitzvos than any other Parsha in the Torah. Of the 613 mitzvos in the Torah, 74 of them are found in this week's Parsha. So it's a rapid fire of mitzvos. And let's try to learn it and see what lessons we could derive. So the first mitzvah that it talks about is a very strange sounding mitzvah. You go out to war against your enemies and you'll be victorious. And then you're going to find a beautiful captive uh, amongst the captives and you're going to want to marry her. So you have Jewish soldiers going to war and they see a beautiful woman who they are desirous of. What do they do then? So the Torah outlines what has to happen. Uh, they can take her. Uh, however, provided that there's certain uh, there's certain requirements that are met. First of all, uh, they, the, the Torah is obviously discouraging this. So you can bring her, but you, she shouldn't beautify herself. You should realize that this is probably a bad idea. And the Torah goes on to say that if you do marry such a woman, it's very likely that you will go on to hate her. Uh, but you can, if you want, you can convert her and she can join the Jewish people. Now, uh, Rashi tells us, what's this idea that you go to war and you find a Gentile captive woman and you're suddenly allowed to marry her? Since when does the Torah start waiving prohibitions uh, because of the conditions of war? So Rashi tells us, very famous Rashi, that the Torah, lo dibra Torah ela keneged hara. The Torah did not speak in this instance, only in opposition to counter the Yetzer Ra. Why? Because if the Almighty does not permit her, you'll marry her in sin. What the Torah is saying is like this. Someone goes out to war, very treacherous conditions uh, that really change a person. And therefore, he is very susceptible to engaging a behavior that is unlike the behavior he would uh, partake in otherwise. And therefore, the Torah says, if I do not allow this to go through, it'll happen in sin. And I think this is a good uh, just mantra. It's a good motto. If you want to know what is Torah, what's the objective Torah? How does Torah, how is Torah oriented to change a person? Here is perhaps a good answer. Lo dibra Torah ella kidneged yetzahara. The Torah is only coming to speak against the yetzahara. We're placed in this world and we have, uh, we have headwinds. We face challenges. There's a yetzahara, a force that is hell-bent on making us fail and making us lose what's special about us and making us sin. And the Torah is the tool for us overcoming this grave challenge. The Talmud tells us famously in the book of Kedushin that the Almighty says to the Jewish people, I created a Yetzirah, I created a force that is oriented, that is designed, that is engineered to get you to sin, Barasi Torah Tavlin. I created the Torah as an antidote. And I think this also is illustrative Uh, of how we have to engage with our internal conflict. We have desires, desires of prohibited things, and we're supposed to resist them. We have a Yetzirah, we're supposed to fight against it. Well, what do we see over here? A man goes to war, and he sees a beautiful captive, and he desires her, and the Torah says, capitulate, take her. And of course, the question is, is obvious. Shouldn't you resist the Yetzirah? Shouldn't you repel it? Why does the Torah allow this to happen? And of course, these are good questions. But uh, there's a theme that my grandfather used to always bring about with regards to battling the Yetzirah by comparing it to a spring. We know when you push a spring, uh, you feel a little kickback, a little pushback. But if you push it too hard, the pushback is going to be so excessive, it's going to send you flying in the opposite direction direction. When we want to resist our yates, when we want to overcome these grave challenges, we have to push it only a little bit. We have to resist only a little bit. If you push it too hard, if you try to resist it too much, then 
it's going to have the reverse effect. It's going to have the backlash, and you're going to suffer much more uh, than you. The, the, the loss is going to be greater than what you're going to gain. Uh, there are some people, especially now during the month of Elul, people try to take their their spiritual responsibility more seriously. And there are some people that like to do what's called a ta'anit dibur. Ta'anit means a fast, to withhold from food, but dibur means words. People would say to themselves, listen, words cause sin, and I don't want to sin, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop saying any words. I'm going to take a whole day off and be like a monk and be a day in silence. Some people do that, and there are the books of spirituality that encourage such behavior. But my grandfather used to always say, when someone does a ta'anit dibur, when someone says, I'm going to withhold from talking for a whole day, what actually happens in, in all likelihood is that when the day comes and the day's over, they have so much words and so much gossip bottled up within them that there's an explosion. So ironically, sometimes you push too hard, then the backlash and the totality, the aggregate, you're worse off. That's another lesson we see from here. The Torah obviously understands in this case, with the conditions of war and the testosterone being so high, the it's impossible for you to overcome this challenge, and therefore the Torah is going to carve out a way, a loophole to make it permitted. Because if you try to overcome this, it may, uh, it, it may backfire. And I think there's another important lesson from this episode, from this mitzvah. Here the Torah tells us, you can't control it. But what does that imply? Only over here you can control it. Every other time you can. The Almighty only gives us challenges that we can withstand and we can overcome. If we cannot overcome it, if we cannot withstand it, then we will not be given it. And perhaps in this instance, with the uh, beautiful captive in war, it's a case where we cannot overcome it. And therefore, the Torah says, let's find a way to allow it. You know, maybe we can even connect this to the flood. You know, the Almighty gave Houston as a city and all of us as individuals uh, grave challenges. Uh, But obviously, the Almighty believes in the resolve and the, uh, the purpose and the unity and the camaraderie of our city and our people to gather together and rebuild, and we can and we will overcome. Another point, if you remember last week, who was part of the Jewish uh, army. So remember last week, they talked about the fact that all the eligible men were gathered and they had a selection process. Who was going to be part of this army? And they weeded off anyone who had recently gotten engaged but wasn't married, anyone that had recently built a house but didn't live in it, and anyone that had planted a vineyard but did not harvest it. And additionally, anyone that has any sins. So you think about it. You have an army, and there's no sinners as soldiers in the army. All you have are righteous people. And what happens? The Torah says in the next parsha, you draw it to war, and all you have is righteous soldiers. And what happens? One of them sees a beautiful captive, and he gets so lustfully desirous of her, and he says, I, I have to have her. Wait a minute, don't you have a family back home? What about your spiritual stature? The answer is that when someone goes out of the confines of their comfort zone, when someone goes to an area where they don't have the same guard up for things to protect themselves against things that could happen, no one knows where that can lead. My grandfather used to say he spent the war years, World War II in Sweden, and he was a yeshiva student. He was a Torah scholar who went to Sweden, but he wasn't the only one that went to Sweden. He said there was many, many yeshiva students that would go to Sweden as a refuge, because Sweden was neutral during World War II. And he said, almost to a man, yeshiva students that went to a place like this, that didn't value and denigrated Torah and Torah scholars, their spiritual stature tanked. And within a month, most of them had dropped everything. And now he himself would say about himself that the reason why he maintained his stature in such conditions is because he studied Musar. 
He studied ethical refinement every day. But it's very easy, or it's not very easy, but at least it's manageable for someone to maintain their status when they're in a cocoon, when you're in yeshiva, when you're in an environment that is conducive for such behavior. You go out to work, or you go to business meetings, or you go to you go on a business trip, and you don't have your wife there, and you don't have your family there, and you don't have your community there, then you're very vulnerable. And we see these great people went to war, they went out, they're in the world, there's new conditions, there's new situations, and they're vulnerable. But we see the Torah does not despair. Even someone who has fallen what we would consider to be very grave depths. You know, they're now consorting with a enemy captive. Still, the Torah legislates for such a person. We don't give up on anyone. You think perhaps we could say, oh, this person, well, they have bad character or they have bad behavior or they're a drug addict. These people, they, 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 they went they're, they're the drug addicts, so to speak. They're the people who are the dregs of society. And still the Torah says we don't give up on anyone. The Parsha continues by talking about a man who has two wives, one of them that he loves and one of them that he hates. And the halacha is if uh, a man gives, uh, when a person dies, they bequeath their assets to their children. And the firstborn son, he takes uh, double portion. So they divide the portion amongst the children and the, the firstborn son gets a double portion. If the firstborn son is the son of the hated wife, then they he still must receive the double portion. That's what the next, that's what the next uh, section continues. Now Rashi explains the juxtaposition between these two episodes. The parasha starts off with a man who marries a woman, a Gentile woman, out of lust. And it says, the very next section, if you have a wife that you hate, says Rashi, there's a deep connection between these two stories. When someone marries a woman out of lust, that union is probably not very strong because the lust invariably dissipates and lust alone will cause division. And uh, the verse tells us in Proverbs when, you, when there's tava, when there's lust alone, invariably that will eventually weaken. And what do you have left? If the foundations of the relationship are lust alone, invariably, says the Torah, that you'll have a wife, you'll have one that you will hate. And the next section talks about, well, what happens when you have a wife that you hate? What does that do to the children? And the next section, beginning in verse 18, talks about when a man has a ben sorer umore, a wayward and rebellious son. This is a son who doesn't listen to his parents, who steals money from his parents and buys meat and wine, eats it in a bad company. And the halacha is that such a person, on first offense, they have to be 13 years old and change. First offense, they get, stone, they get uh, lashes. Second offense, they get executed. Now, the Talmud says that this actually never happened. Never happened, never will happen. So why is it written? It's written so that you should study it and gain reward. And the Talmud tells us that someone who steals money, well, yes, they're a criminal. And someone who eats wine in bad company, well, maybe that's not such great behavior. But does that really warrant that they should get executed? Of course not. So why do we kill the Ben Sorero Moret? the wayward and rebellious son. Says the Talmud in Sanhedrin, Yamus Zakai, let him die righteous, Ve'al Yamus Chayav, and let him not die wicked. The Torah is able to prognosticate. It's able to look into the future and say, someone who behaves like this now, invariably in the future, they will behave in a way that will guarantee that they will have a capital, be worthy of capital punishment. And therefore, it's better to kill him today when he's still innocent. He hasn't committed any grievous uh, sins uh, worthy of capital punishment than to wait for him to be killed and executed as a result of his sins. Now, obviously, the question is, if this never happened and never will happen, then why is it, why are we told about it? And perhaps, and the Talmud says, well, you study it and you gain reward. So what's this reward that you gain? So of course, all the commentaries explain what this means, what the reward is. 
Simply put, it means, well, you study Torah, and there's a great reward for studying Torah. But perhaps on a deeper level, we could say as follows. The halacha is that a ben soreru more only gets executed if his parents willfully take him to court. So if the parents opt out, they say, you know what? We don't want to have this case uh, judged. We don't want him to bring him to court. If they opt to not bring him to court, then the case doesn't happen. And they have to bring him to court once to be flogged, a second time to be executed. And that's the reason why the Talmud says it never happened, never will happen, because no parent is going to bring their uh, cherubic, innocent, adolescent to court to be executed. But perhaps we could say that this is maybe the lesson. Perhaps a parent has to recognize that a child, their responsibility is that the child flourishes. And how do they flourish? More specifically, not just that they flourish in their physical sense, in their body, so to speak, in this world, but that they flourish in their soul, and they flourish for eternity, and they're here for a mission. And the worst thing that can happen to someone is, on a spiritual sense, is they live live a life of sin. And they live a life where they behave in a way that erodes and corrodes their soul. And therefore, the lesson is that a parent should recognize, think about it, maybe even theoretically recognize that the Torah tells you, Yomus Zakai Va'al Yomus Chayev, it is preferable for your son to die innocently than to die old as a sinner. And there's been many times in history, um, for example, during the Crusades, it was quite common where the Jews would know that their children are going to be kidnapped by the Christians, very young children, not going to remember their Jewish identity, and they're going to be raised as Christians. And there's been many times documented in history where Jewish parents actually killed their own children to save them from the fate of living as an apostate, living as a Christian. And this is an example, of course, it's a very tragic happenstance, but this is an example of this idea where a parent recognizes that their responsibility as a parent extends beyond the physical, earthly, ephemeral well-being of their child and extends to the spiritual, eternal life of the child. And therefore, it's more important that the child that the child dies righteous, even if it means dying righteous young, than to live their life as a sinner. The next section talks about what happens when someone is executed in a in a court. And we know there's four methods of execution, and the worst of them, which is called stoning, it has within it another halacha that the, that the body, after it's executed, it has to be hung. Talmud tells us that this is only for several minutes. They have to hang him uh, before nightfall, right? Immediately before nightfall, and then right before nightfall, take him down, because you have to bury him right away. And... It's interesting, you know, the Talmud study, uh, the Talmud understands from this particular section the mitzvah of burying the dead quickly. Uh, what happens when someone dies and their children, well, they, they have a few things going on. So what happens typically in non-Jewish environments is that they wait till it's a more convenient time to have the funeral. Wait for the children, wait till for a Sunday, uh, wait, wait for all the other elements uh, to be present. We're told in Jewish law that it's imperative that the person is buried as soon as possible. So long as the cadaver is not interred in the ground, the soul actually experiences excruciating pain and suffering. And the Talmud even describes how the soul is, so to speak, suspended between two worlds and doesn't begin the process of transitioning from this world to the next world until the body is covered, which is why, for example, in Jerusalem, the custom is that as soon as the person dies, they bury him, even if it means burying them in the middle of the night or uh, late at night or in a way where the person uh, will not have a very... Uh, well-attended funeral. In my grandfather's case, uh, because my grandfather was such a great rabbi and scholar who had a tremendous impact on many of the people of his generation, 
the halachic authorities ruled that even though he died late at night, around 10 p.m., they could delay the funeral until noon the following day because that would be an honor for the deceased to have a much more well-attended funeral than it's allowed. And the Talmud says if, if, you, if you're delaying your funeral for the benefit of the, of the deceased, you're allowed to delay it. However, if it's just for your own convenience, then it would not be allowed. There's another um, story about verse 22, chapter 21, verse 22. The verse reads, literally, when a man has a sin, a judgment of death, and he is killed, and you should hang him on a tree. Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, the Ramak, one of the great Kabbalists of yore in Tzfat, when he died, the Arizal, Rabbi Isaac Luria, he used this verse to eulogize him. And he read it as follows. When a man has a chet mishpat mavetz, chet literally means a lacking. When someone is lacking a mishpat mavetz, there's no reason why they should die. They're lacking a judgment of death. They have not sinned, and they, there's no reason why they should die. Vihumas, however, they die anyhow. Vitalisa osa al ha'etz. You should explain their death by looking at the eights, at the tree. Which means when Adam ate from the tree, he, the, the, the world is forever now going to suffer the fate of death. And most people die because of their own sins. But when someone dies and there is a dearth of sins, there's no way we can explain it. We have to explain it going back to the tree. Uh, another uh, important Rashi here. Uh, Rashi says that we have to take the person down because it's a shame to God the fact that there is a human being hung. And Rashi tells us a very famous example. You have two twins. One of them became a king and the other one became a, a criminal. And the criminal was tried and was uh, sentenced to death and was hung. When everyone sees him hanging, they say, oh no, the king was hung because the person is an identical twin to the king. And that is a shame for the king. So too says Rashi, when a human sins and a human is executed because man is created in the image of God, it's almost like man is a twin with the Almighty. Therefore, it's a shame to God to have him be hung and therefore he has to be taken down as soon as possible. And I think that's a very powerful lesson Like to think about, like, wow, we are like twins with God. How much responsibility uh, does it mean for us when we have this on our shoulders, the fact that we are a representation of God, and all the more so, not just as humanity, as a species, but as Jews, as we've seen several times throughout Deuteronomy, we are called the chosen people of God. When people look at us, they see us as a proxy of God. How much more so do we need to make sure that our behavior is worthy of such a classification? Chapter 22 begins with the laws of returning a lost object. Uh, there's many details, of course, as all Torah laws are, especially this uh, laws found in this week's Parsha. But generally speaking, if you find a lost object, your duty is to find the original owner and return it to him. Uh, what if you can't find the owner? Then you have to be a worthy steward of that item. The Talmud in the book of Tainus on page 25 tells us a remarkable story about the great Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. There's many stories told to us about him specifically. Uh, this one relates to uh, returning lost objects. And the story goes that he found... Uh, his wife specifically found a basket of eggs on their front door. And it, of course, it was a lost object. So they brought it inside. And Rabbi Hanim Adosa told his wife, don't eat these eggs. So that eventually the eggs hatched and became into little chickens. And the chickens started to propagate. And he sold them and he bought much bigger animals. He bought goats. And many, sometime later, the goats are growing and there's a whole flock of them. And the person who lost the item, he's like, I left a bunch of eggs over here. Do you know where those eggs are? 
So he brings them out to the pasture and so shows them a whole flock of goats. Here are your eggs. And he gave them all those goats. Uh, of course, that shows the great character of our great sages. Now, in verse 3, I'm sorry, verse 2 here, it says that you should return a lost object to him. And the Talmud actually points out that if there is a requirement to return someone's physical item, someone loses their wallet or they lose, um, I don't know, their phone, you have to return it to them. Well, what if they lose their body or they lose their soul? The Talmud says, if you see someone, and I think this is, of course, very pertinent to us today in Houston, if you see someone who is about to lose their life, it's actually a requirement to return, so to speak, their lost object, which is their life, to them. Their life is in flux. Will they live? Will they die? You got to return it to them. And of course, if it's a mitzvah to save someone's life, uh, how much more so is it a mitzvah to save someone's spiritual life? And of course, we say that Torah is life, and thus by teaching Torah, by spreading Torah, by supporting Torah, we are returning, so to speak, the souls uh, to their rightful owners. The verse continues, many, many laws here. We, we can't go through all of them at once, does not not to cross-stress, that's one of the laws. And then there's the law of the Khan Sipor, the Shiloh uh, HaKhan, and just briefly, what it means is you, you're traveling and you uh, happen to chance upon a nest that has eggs or has little chitlets, and you have to send away the mom before taking away the eggs. And the verse concludes, if you do this mitzvah, it'll be good for you and you should ha- you'll have a long life, says Rashi. This is a mitzvah after all. That's a free mitzvah, right? You go out to your field or you, you happen to be walking along the path and you see a nest and it has eggs in it, you just send away the mom and take away the eggs and it's yours to keep. And if a free mitzvah, a mitzvah doesn't cost anything, guarantees a reward of eternal life, how much more so does a mitzvah that's difficult to do, a mitzvah perhaps that's costly, how much more so can we be assured of being given a fair reward on orders of magnitude of greatness uh, to, uh, to the act that we contributed. The uh, principle is le fum tsara agra. The degree of pain and difficulty we have in doing any mitzvah is proportional to the reward that we have for doing a mitzvah. If a mitzvah, two people could do the same mitzvah. One, for one of them, it's easy. For one of them, it's hard. The person who, they do, they do, they're doing the exact same action, but the Almighty judges it in relative terms. For someone who was very difficult to do it, they get a great reward. Someone who was easy for, well, they, they get a reward, but not quite as great. Next law, someone builds a house. They have to build a fence around the roof so that no one will fall down. And if they fall down, of course, they are liable. So I think this does not apply only, of course, to uh, homes, uh, to swimming pools, uh, to any kind of dangerous obstacle, you have to ensure that there is safety uh, for those around it. They shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't, God forbid, fall in or hurt themselves. Now, there's an interesting um, philosophical dilemma uh, surrounding this mitzvah. Uh, the mitzvahs were told to put a fence around their house and to not pay, place blood in our homes. What this means is, is that if we don't put a fence around our roof and someone dies, well, we cause them to die. And the philosophical question is, wait a minute, doesn't God oversee everything? Doesn't God decide who dies and when they die? Why is it placed in our hands? Or what's kind of the philosophical understanding of how the fact, how we're told here that we are the ones who are in charge to ensure that no one else dies? So there's a very important uh, chinuch. The chinuch is a book written in the 13th, 12th or 13th century. Uh, its origins, exact authorship is somewhat unknown. We know his name is Rabbi Aaron Halevi. Who it is exactly is a subject of dispute. But what he does is he delineates the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah in the order in which they appear in the Torah. And he gives a little synopsis of the laws of the mitzvah, uh, who to whom it applies, and additionally, he talks about what the roots of the mitzvah are. What is the meaning? What's the lessons behind the mitzvah? 
And in this particular mitzvah, he addresses our question. You're told to put a fence around your roof. And if you don't put a fence around your roof, you may be causing people to die. Wait a minute. Doesn't the Almighty oversee everything? And knows what's happening? And everything good and happened only happens because of what he wants? And he says something very powerful. He says, the Almighty created the world and built it on the foundations of Teva, of nature. And he ruled, he decreed that fire burns and, and water extinguishes fire. And he also ruled that if a huge stone falls on someone's head, God forbid, then their, their brain will be squashed. And if someone falls off a, uh, a roof that's very tall, they'll die. So there's this balance here that the Almighty placed us in a world and we're kind of subject to the rules of nature. And therefore, we have the mind and the mitzvah and the mandate to ensure that bad things don't happen as a result of our negligence. Therefore, we're told that we have to have a fence around the roof or else we may cause someone to die. And I think this extends to other areas of, of, of living. Uh, we, the Almighty gives us everything. Well, so can I just lay down on my couch and wait for the Almighty to parachute all the goodness to me? Of course not. There is this balance. And we talk about prayer. Prayer really raises the same question. Someone's sick, so I want to pray for that they get better. I say, God, this person is good. Let, it, let him be better. Give us healing. Well, wait a minute. If the person is sick, who made him sick? It's God that made him sick. If the person's poor, well, who made them poor? It's God. So how can I try to interfere and say, you know what? You, God, you want him to be sick, but I want him to be, I want him to be better. And the answer is, is that who runs the world? Of course, the Almighty does the, runs the world. But the Almighty gives us. We're creating the image of God. We also have a say in what happens. And therefore, with our prayer... We take a seat at the table and we say, you know what? This person is either going to live or going to die. If we don't pray, he may die. If we do pray, we are declaring that we want him to live. And therefore, we indeed do have a say. A very powerful teaching from the Chinuch that shows us this balance that we have to strike. Of course, we have to recognize that everything's from God, but that we should not rest on our laurels and be complacent and not do what it is that we need to do to achieve what it is we want to achieve. Uh, and he continues by talking about the great tzaddikim, Abraham. Right? Abr- if we are subject to nature... Abraham, he's a step up on the totem pole. Nature is subject to him. So Abraham's thrown into the fire. Well, what happens? The fire doesn't impact him at all. Even his hair is not singed. Hanani, Mishal, and Azariah, they're thrown into the lion's den. Well, lions that are hungry eat people. But that's the rules of nature. A tzaddik can transcend and go above that and not be subject to the laws of nature at all. We talk about the Torah as being the blueprint for creation. alma. The Almighty used the Torah to create the world. And therefore, the Torah, so to speak, governs the world. If someone is a master of Torah, by definition, they're a master of the world as well. If someone is not have Torah, well, then they're subject to the world. If someone does have Torah to this very high degree, then the to- the world is subject to them. Uh, next couple of laws here talk about kilaim, various forms of kilaim. We're not allowed to intermix uh, uh, different species to breed. We're not allowed to uh, have different species pull a plow together. We're not allowed to uh, take wool and linen and weave it together into one garment. Uh, we're not allowed to have two uh, forms of grain to be planted next to each other. Uh, and then the uh, next case talks about what happens when a man accuses his wife of being unfaithful. So there's many details of this law, but generally uh, put uh, that we have to have a court case to find out if the man's claims are legitimate or not. If he lied, then he gets flogged. They bring him to court and they punish him in a very severe way. They bring him basically an inch away from death. They take a massive rod and they cane him 
uh, if he makes a false accusation of his wife's unfaithfulness. And additionally, he's penalized, and all the keys to determining what happens with this relationship is given to her. So a man, generally, a couple, they're allowed to get divorced if they want to, but that's a bilateral decision. Uh, Here, if a man accuses his wife of uh, committing adultery, uh, and he turns out to be a liar, that a right that he has to have a say in the termination of the marriage is removed from him. Uh, so a lot of people like to look at this as being an example of uh, somewhat some sort of barbarism. The Torah forces a man uh, to, to uh, a woman to be part to be to par- partake in a marriage against her will. That's the exact opposite. Here, the woman's given all the keys. If the man was Uh, not uh, being honest in his claim of unfaithfulness, uh, then she can decide if she wants a divorce, but he has to remain with her and he has to follow whatever she says. Uh, Now, what happens if there was a a case of rape? Uh, We're told if a woman's raped, she is not uh, held responsible, of course. Uh, People cannot help responsible for behavior that they could not have stopped. Uh, but additionally, in a case where the woman was unmarried, and we know historically, when a woman was defiled in such a way, she'll become uh, damaged goods. And therefore, a woman has the option, if she wants, to marry the man, the man who seduced her, uh, and he cannot divorce her again because, if she chooses, of course, this is up to her decision to choose, but that is... Um, an example of giving her a leg up, so to speak, where he can no longer divorce her uh, for the rest of his life, and she can choose if she wants, and she has all the all the power. Uh, the parsha continues talking about um, various people that are not allowed to marry amongst the Jewish people. Uh, so, for example, a mamzer. Mamzer is someone who is a product, a progeny of a prohibited relationship. They cannot marry amongst the Jewish people. People with various illnesses uh, or injuries cannot marry amongst the Jewish people. And then it talks about the Ammonim and the Moavim. These are various nations that the Jewish people interacted with previously in the Torah. And we're told even if they convert and become Jewish, they're not allowed to intermarry amongst the Jewish people. And interestingly, the Torah in verse 5 of chapter 23 tells us the reason why these nations are not allowed to intermarry amongst the Jewish people. When the Jewish people were vulnerable, when the Jewish people had grave needs, and they encountered this nation, this nation did not come out and greet them with bread and with water. To be a Jew to be part of the Jewish nation, to be part of the Jewish destiny, to be a bearer of the Abrahamic legacy, you have to have good character. A nation that is so corrupted that they're not willing to show favor and to reach out to those in need, they're a nation that cannot be part of the Jewish people. If they did not come out and see the refugee nation, they're escaping Egypt, and they don't come out and give them bread and water, If they don't have kindness, that's the Jewish baseline. They can never join the Jewish nation. They can never intermarry amongst the people. Uh, However, the Egyptians, uh, they are allowed to intermarry, provided that they're three generations removed. So if you have an Egyptian family that converts, their grandchildren will be allowed to intermarry amongst the Jewish people. And Rashi points out that the Moabites, they were the ones who tried to engage in sin with the nation and cause their spiritual devolvement. So it's interesting. The Egyptians, we remember Exodus, these were the genocidal murderers who took Jewish babies and threw them into the water and killed them. So how is it possible that the nation that is uh, uh, so morally corrupt that they kill babies, infanticide, they're allowed to join the Jewish people, but the Moabites are not. So Rashi says, look at this. This shows that someone who has spiritual sins, they're worse than someone that has physical sins. The Jewish people were attacked by two nations. The Egyptians attacked them physically. 
the Moabites attached, attacked them spiritually. Which one's worse? The Moabites. A spiritual loss is much worse than a physical. Spiritual violence is much deadlier than physical violence. Uh, verse 10 here. When you go out to war against your enemies, you should guard from any bad thing. The ensuing verses, verses show us the bad thing that it's referencing is sinful thoughts at night. And the Talmud, very famous teaching in the Talmud that serves as the basis of the book, The Path of the Just, The Way of the Upright, Mesilas Yasharm of Ramchal, it's based upon a Talmudic teaching on this verse. What does it mean that you should not have, you should, you should guard yourself from any evil? Don't think things during the day that will bring you to impurity during the night. You should avoid any sort of behavior by day that causes sin by night. And on that, Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair, the great uh, Tana, the great rabbi of the Mishnahite era, he's, he lays out the whole ladder of the book of Mesiel Yesharim. You start with Torah. Torah brings you to vigilance, which brings you to alacrity, which brings you to cleanliness, which eventually brings you all the way to the highest levels of greatness, fear of sin, and holiness. And it's really interesting that where do we start? We start of we start we started with a question. How do you prevent sin at night? by not sinning during the day, or not thinking things during the day. And Rabbi Pinchas ben was sitting there, and he's trying to figure out how is it possible to prevent the ball from rolling, the beginnings, the germination of sin. And on that, he built what became the whole book of Mesiel Sisharim, this whole process, starting with Torah and in integrating that into character to cleanse, so to speak, all the hardware, the physiology that causes sin, stop it before it gets started. And therefore, you won't think sinful things by day and won't bring you to a sinful nighttime. Um, okay, so there's many other uh, laws brought one after another, of course. So, for example, if, you can't, if, you have a, if, if there's an escaped slave, you can't return him to the owner. Uh, there should not be uh, people, boys and girls, designated for sin amongst the Jewish people. Don't uh, take um, usury interest from your Jewish brethren. You have to pay your debts if you pledge to give a donation to tzedakah or to the temple. You have to make sure you pay it. Uh, additionally, if you have a, if you have a uh, an employee who's working in the fields, you cannot say you can, that he cannot partake in any of the foods. Uh, and then chapter twenty four begins with a law of someone who gets married, and it's interesting. We know Jewish marriages happen through a conveyance of money. So, for example, a man gives a woman a ring. He says a special formula: "Behold, you are married to me. Behold, you are betrothed to me." Gives her the ring. She becomes married. What is the source that marriage transactions happen with monetary value? It's verse twenty, chapter twenty-four, verse one of Deuteronomy. When a man when a man shall take a woman, how do we know that? How does that transaction happen? So if you look all the way back in Genesis, when Abraham is buying a burial spot, a grave spot for his wife Sarah. Uh, and he buys it from Ephron, it says uh, the word kach with regards to money. And the Talmud says, well, here it says kach with regards to money. And here it says kach with regards to marriage. It must be that these two words, because they're the same word, they're linking these two sections together. And thus, just like the transaction with the grave happened with money, so the transaction of marriage happens with money. And I think it's a great example of the intricacies of the Torah's written Torah and the oral Torah integration. If I told you, find me in the Torah, anywhere where it says that marriage happens with money, in all likelihood, you could look for days on end, you won't find it. But with the oral Torah, the oral Torah is like the decryption key. The written Torah, it's, everything is there, it just, it's hidden. Well, how do you find what the message really is? You take the oral Torah and you use that as a prism to try to understand the written Torah and you could reveal all its secrets. 
Uh, again, many laws one after another. Let's go through them really quickly here. Uh, a man gets married. He's not allowed to go to war, but also he has to be home for an entire year. At the nascent stages of marriage, where the couple are getting to know each other, they're acclimating with each other, and there's, of course, many hurdles and obstacles that need to overcome. It's important that they have time with each other. They spend time with each other for at least a year. He doesn't go away on business trips. He doesn't go away at nights. They're together. Uh, I would say perhaps we could say uh, in today's day and age, people could be together, but everyone's glued to their phone. I would probably surmise the Torah doesn't mean just be together. It means develop and deepen and nourish the relationship so that I could grow and flourish forever in the future. Uh, there's a law of a kidnapper. What happens if someone kidnaps, God forbid? Uh, again, we're told not to speak negatively about other people. Lashon Hara will get saras. Remember what happened to Miriam. Uh, what happens if someone, if you lend someone money and you take a collateral? Don't walk into his house to demand the collateral because that is de- demeaning for him. Wait outside, let him give it to you. If he's poor, don't take away the collateral that he needs uh, for his daily use. Uh, don't cheat the poor person. Don't cheat the convert, the people that are less fortunate amongst you. Pay someone on the day they're, they're, they're supposed to be paid. Don't let them wait and have to ask you for it. Um, don't deviate. Don't pervert the judgment of the proselyte, of the convert, or the uh, orphan. Remember that you too were once unfortunate when you were slaves in Egypt. Hashem saved you. Therefore, you have to remember those people as well. When you have a field and there's various leftovers, there's bundles that you left, there's various grapes that you left, you drop something, leave it for the poor, leave it for the hungry, leave it for the convert, leave it for the widow, leave it for the orphan. Chapter 25 Uh, talks about some of the judicial procedures and laws. Just a quick note here, there is a famous idea called kimle bidarabamine, which means if someone with one act or in, in one time, they commit two sins, one sin that warrants them a very severe punishment and one a more relatively minor punishment. We're told here, just an interesting law that appears very frequently in the Talmud, don't uh, meet out both punishments, give them the more uh, severe punishment, which is more inclusive. So if someone, for example, uh, commits an act that gives them capital punishment, and in the same act they also damage someone someone's property, you only give them the more severe punishment, not the more minor punishment. Uh, There's a law of Leverite marriage. Two brothers, one of them dies without children. The second brother marries uh, the widow to build a legacy and a namesake for the deceased brothers. I'll just say uh, quickly, uh, this appears in 10 verses in Deuteronomy or six verses in Deuteronomy. Uh, I spent many months, even years of my life studying the Talmud book of Yevamos, which talks about Leverite marriages and all its details. So, of course, we're skimming through the Torah, just trying to get the whole story of the Parsha and pull some quick lessons. But of course, the depths of the the discussion are uh, endless and profound. Uh, The Parsha concludes with a shop owner to not have mismatched uh, stones. So suppose when someone says, I want to buy a pound of potatoes and you have a stone that equals a pound to weigh it out, it should be no less than a pound. Don't have small stones for selling and big stones for buying. And if someone does that, if someone is dishonest in business, the Parsha ends with remembering Amalek. Amalek is the nation that is most opposite to the Jewish people. If we stand up for truth and for justice and for righteousness and for God, they stand up for everything that's in opposition to that. They are essentially the Torah's version of the Nazis. Evil and pure evil. Says the Torah, when you see these people, you have to remember to destroy them. And I think the lesson is that there's some people and some nations and some elements of society that are beyond repair and must be squashed and must must be eradicated. For God to be in the world, for God's glory to be manifest, there cannot be a forces that are uh, antithetical uh, to that. Amalek is an idea, it's a nation, uh, but it's also a rallying cry. It is what we as a nation, the Jewish people, 
are designed to combat and ultimately to dismantle and to destroy. Uh, thank you all for participating in this class. Uh, again, it's a very sad day and a sad week for the people of Houston, and we pray that all the people that are in danger don't get hurt, and all the people whose homes and property and businesses were devastated, that they should be able to rebuild, and hopefully our city and our people will come together. Uh, and again, at Torch, you know, there's a lot of people who have grave needs. Uh, at Torch, uh, there's about two feet of water. It's going to be a monumental effort to rebuild Torch, to be able to continue disseminating Torah throughout Houston and throughout the world. Uh, it would mean the world to me if you could go right now and go to torchweb.org and make a donation to help Torch get back on its feet and to continue the efforts of rebuilding, rebuilding our city, rebuilding our organization, and may the Almighty be with us and with all the people that are hurt. Thank you, and uh, uh, may, we, may we only hear good tidings uh, in the future. <laughs>